This is Sports Daily on Wichita's number one sports radio, 97.5 and 1240 KFH. All right, welcome in, everybody. Sports Daily, right here on KFH. Jacob Albrock, Paul Savage with you on this Wednesday, a hump day. A lot to get to today. Chat Chambers producing. He's got the IHOP hotline ready to go, 869-1240. If you want to chime in with us on the program today, you can also leave us your comments on our video stream, which you can find on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. We've got you all covered here on Sports Daily. Glad to be here with you. Uh, Tommy continues uh, being a dad two times over now. Congratulations if you missed the news yesterday to the casters for the new addition to their family. Tommy will be back with you next week with Paul. I'll be out. Uh, All savage all the time. Well, it sure seems that way anymore, doesn't it, big boy? It does. It does. we got a lot to talk about today. This is an Albrock Savage classic today because we'll talk a lot of college football. Uh, Paul and I always seem to find our way into some some college football talk when we're on the show together. We've got uh, all kinds of good stuff coming for you. Maybe a little baseball news to sprinkle in as well. Interesting things. Certainly some Wichita State baseball news, Paul, as we begin there. Um, Interesting. Yesterday, as we're on the air, the decision made to move on from Lauren Hibbs. And between then and now, more than 20 Wichita State baseball players have entered the transfer portal. Uh, You had to know this was going to be a part of that process if you were Kevin Saul. I assume he talked to some of the players before he made this decision. I hope he talked to some of the players before he made this decision. So I will assume that there was some knowledge that you were going to have this mass exodus as a part of this process now. Um, It, you know, it it comes with it. I don't know that, you know, there's going to be a lot more probably upset members of the fan base and the alumni, Paul, with Lauren Hibbs's history with the university, his long track record as a coach, and the and the improvements that they did make. It wasn't enough, but it was improvement over a year ago, an inherited mess. But here's where I keep coming back to, Paul. Like, and I've seen some of the blowback, and I get it. And I've said before, I I would have given Lauren Hibbs one or two years to see uh, what what happens with it, but. If there was that much support, why weren't people at the games, Paul? And that's what I sort of come back to. And I think what makes this such a difficult decision for the university to make, because at the end, two things need to happen for that program. They need to make NCAA tournaments, which they haven't in a decade. And they need to put butts in the seats at X Stadium, which they haven't done in like a decade. So I I get it. I do. I, I don't, you know, it's a tough situation because even when there is this support that you can feel after the decision is made, you have to think back to, you know, it's still not bringing people to the games and the, and the program still is not reaching the postseason. Very difficult spot. Um, and you know, it's, we're going to have some fallout from it. I think that's what we're seeing with the player transfers. Well, but I'm not sure it's fair to lay that off on coach Hibbs at this point. I'm not laying it off on coach Hibbs at all. I'm just saying, yeah, the university I, feels pressure to make those two things happen. Right. I'm not saying it's, of no, course no, it's no, not no, the chips not you. And I didn't mean you, but I mean, for anybody to like, I mean, whether it's the school, whether it's Kevin, whether it's the, uh, you know, the fan base, I, we can't lay anything on it. We don't know, but here's the thing. I mean, you know, he had a chance for a half a season. Well, that's not enough of a chance to, to really do. And by the way, pretty good half season. If you ask me uh, to get to a point where you're coach of the year, <laughs> not bad, is it? That's not too bad at all, but, it's probably to be expected. I know Coach Hibbs. Coach Hibbs is a player's coach. You know what I mean when when they say a player's coach? You, I know you know. But it, it's one of those guys who happens to be a coach. He can be a, of any sport, really. And he's a guy who understands the game, but also understands what a young athlete is going through. He understands his situation. And it could be money. It could be girlfriend problems. It could be family problems. It could be academic problems. It could be, I mean, and he has a way of understanding what your particular needs are. That's a player's coach. That's a guy that understands. 
And I think Coach Hibbs was that. And and as long as I've known him, uh, which is for some good period of time, uh, yes, I believe he is what we would call a player's coach. And it's hard to understand. And, of course, with the portal. Now a portal becomes a way to disapprove with your feet. That's what a portal becomes. Because before before the portal, you wouldn't have this opportunity to say, well, I'm not happy with this situation. And you can't really say that and and and, and expect to, you know, have administration just love you up. That's not the way this works. But, you know, it's it, it, the speed of which this has happened makes me, you know, understand that I'm sure there's, there's several several angles to this entire situation. And as of right now, we don't know, do we? You don't know, and I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows except uh, those inside the athletic department making these decisions. So look, the, the, the decision was made because they the you know, Kevin Saul didn't feel like the program was in the position it needs to be in to put butts in seats and make the NCAA tournament would be my guess. I mean, I think that's logically the, you know, the path you take. I, I, and it's going to suck right for the players that I are currently so. a part of the program. Well, that's obvious. Yeah. And they're leaving. Right. Yeah, and and right. that, you know, that, that stuff is unavoidable when you make changes at head coach. And, and especially when you consider the emotions that went into this season for that team, right. You know, Eric wedge, we can call it mutually parted ways or whatever we want to call it. You know, you, you read between the lines. Um, Eric Wedge was, was you know, let go. And the team had to deal with that. And whatever the circumstances around that were, they were already having to deal with. And then you have Lauren Hibbs, who steps in as a shocker legend, steadies the ship, and has a nice season. There's going to be emotion involved in that. And especially when you're involved in it. I, I mean, we've all had, Paul, probably leadership that we like removed while we're still somewhere, right? Or or leave when we're still somewhere. No and question. that's hard. Yeah. Like, it is difficult to do. And when you've, you know, rallied around. And again, I'm not sure that anybody would say that everything considered this was not a successful season for Wichita state baseball. When you consider everything, of course it was, they won more games than they did a year ago. They finished better in the league. Uh, they had a coach of the year. They had a player of the year. All those things are there. It just, to me came down to does the university, does Kevin Saul see this as the path to getting this team back to the postseason and, and putting butts in those seats clearly that he didn't because he made the change. And, and that's what's going to be difficult. And I can imagine, and we can ask him this the next time we have him in, I can imagine that the blowback from this one is is probably more weighted to supporting Lauren Hibbs than it was with Isaac Brown. Keith Adams left, according to you know everybody on her own terms, but it's another change, and you know clearly Kevin Saul has directions he wants to go with things, and you know that's why he was brought in there, and his job's on the line too. And so I look, I it, it's difficult, and this one's very emotional when all the circumstances. It, it would be like Paul, like you got to remember back when remember when Isaac Brown was hired on the interim tag, and I'm not trying to compare these situations directly, but I am trying to compare them in the emotion inside that locker room. Had the university gone in a different direction, that was that would have been very hard on that locker room, right? After everything, we know the support was there. It was there very directly. It was there from the alumni. It was there from, you know, fans at that point. It was there on so many fronts. You can imagine had they made the change at that point, what the blowback would have been like. It would have been, probably been a lot like what we're seeing right now. And, and that's just the reality of it. And you know, that's what makes them difficult decisions to make and what makes them such high stakes decisions to make. I think in this one, we'll look at this interestingly as, as what it means for the university. Because if Kevin Saul gets men's basketball right, it won't matter, I don't think, what happens, you know, here or with the others because that is such an important program. But this one matters if, you know... It matters, and it's always mattered, you know, to this administration. It's one of the first things that Kevin Saul talked about when we had it the very first time we met Kevin Saul was Wichita State baseball and returning it to its glory days. And that's clearly a goal, Paul. And 
look again, I keep going back to like at some point, if the support was that heavy for the university, the fans have got to show up, you know, and, and, you know, support it and, and be at the games. And I get that that's hard too. Like I'm not blaming fans, but I don't, don't take that the wrong way. It's cold at those games. It's cold in the shadows. If they're not going to make the NCAA, I get it. I'm not saying you should be saying if that's the ultimate success level, then we're talking high profile, high stakes, and you got to get that right. And this is the decision that was made and there's going to be fallout. And right now the fallout is that more than half the roster is transferring away. And, and it, you know, there was some talent on that roster. I say half three quarters of the roster transferring away. So, you know, we'll, <laughs> I don't, I don't know what else to say, except, you know, buckle up. They got to redo now. A, I mean, you're starting from, from scratch pretty much at this point, if they can keep Peyton Tolley, that's, you know, that's the, the top, most high profile name still without a decision that I know of yet, at least this morning. And that's where we sit right now. Well, it tells me what kind of baseball coach that they're going to, you know, circle around on and try to find. And that's, and that's that one guy that has contacts. That's that guy who has a lot of experience. The guy that has been around college baseball has a reputation in college baseball, which State's a great job, but you touched on one thing. We always seem to forget and of course, with the ladies basketball and and, and with uh, now with baseball and those kind of things, you know, Kevin Saul's getting his chance to put his stamp on this uh, university athletic program in a big, 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 big way, very, very quickly. And that's not all bad. But the number one job, and I like the way you kind of phrased it. Let me just let me just sort of quote you a little bit and take it from there. What's the number one job of Kevin Saul right now? There's about on an average, would you say? The games that I've been to, an average of maybe four thousand vacant seats in in uh, in uh, the roundhouse. I, does that sound about average to you? Just just your opinion, real quick. Yeah, yeah probably. 30, probably. That's 3, uh, that's probably maybe. fair. Thirty five hundred, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, well, but not an. It's not a sellout. But which no, is, which is the standard. Which I is get the it. standard. I've grown up with the standard. As long as you've been in Wichita, that's been the standard. The number one job of Kevin Saul is to get every single one of those seats, get a butt in that seat, and have that seat generating revenue for the athletic program. Because this is an athletic program that's going to basically survive on basketball revenue, as we all know. And, of course, with baseball, you know, it's hard to make money in college baseball. Because that's just a fact. There's, you know, high numbers, lots of expenses. You know, you got coaches. Uh, and, of course, Wichita State has always been – pretty famous for paying well to its coaches, which they have deserved. But uh, the number one job for Kevin Saul right now is basketball, getting the seats filled up. And how do you do that? By winning basketball games, by competing for conference championships, by trips to the big dance. That's how you do it. That's where Kevin Saul's focus is, where it needs to be. And you and I both would probably agree with that. And, you know, these these issues that come up with, with – uh, with like Wichita State having so many, so many players transfer out in the portal. Well, you know what? You get a new coach, you go get new players. You know that. You know that new coach is going to have some guys transfer to him. That's just the way this is working. I mean, it sounds horrible, doesn't it? Twenty some players transferring out of Wichita State. Things are really going bad. Well, no, we'll get. They'll, they'll go get some new players. Whoever's hired will go get new players. I'm not so concerned about that. Because this is the day and age in which we live, my friend, in the portal. Portal this, portal that. Who's getting them? Who's losing them? Well, Who, uh, so I mean, and that's that's where I have to also. I I will say this until my face turns blue because right. I don't what? want to. I don't want to put out some vibe that I know I don't about college baseball. I am pleading absolute ignorance and totally. I don't know about college baseball roster construction okay like i don't know i don't know how difficult it is in college baseball now to go to the portal and build a roster i we i just don't know that in college basketball and college football we're very aware of it right it's very high profile it's you know it's in the news it's it's you follow it closely baseball's never been the same there's different scholarships and limits and all of these things so i don't know how difficult it's going to be for somebody to come in and go you know build a roster i don't know what the nil situation is for wichita state baseball to help facilitate that in any way i have no idea okay no clue i know weather's always going to be a challenge in recruiting 
in today's current age. That's why some of the best programs are in the South. That should surprise nobody. Uh, you can come here and play in February and deal with weather or not, you know. So that's a challenge. Uh, there was plenty of, there was tons of talent on this roster, but Paul, isn't that, you know, if we, if this roster was that talented, which I think we think it is, I think if you're, you know, Kevin saw, that's the case you make. We feel like we had this talent and everything else, and we still didn't get back to the NCAA tournament. So I don't know. I don't know enough about that piece of this to have a real strong opinion on it. But what we can do and what I am comfortable with is reacting to what we're seeing. And what we're seeing is a, is a team in a locker room that was clearly committed to Lauren Hibbs. And now that he's gone, they don't want to be here anymore. I mean, that's, that seems pretty simple. Well, I think that's, and, and that's a part of the decision, right? That, and you know that, and you had to know that going in, of course you knew that going in. If Kevin Saul didn't know that going in, then, then to me, that's not doing the right thing because you got to talk to the players before you make a decision like that. And I assume that he did. And I assume he had a pretty good indication that this was coming. If, you know, Lauren Hibbs was not retained, which he wasn't. Lauren Hibbs was never the head coach. He was an interim coach, right? I I, I think that there was, yes. there's probably been a plan and an idea for a long time, based on the things I've heard, to 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 do something wholesale with the program anyway. So, you know, again, it just shouldn't surprise anybody that we're seeing this. Now, if you like it or don't like it, there you go. That's where that's where people are going to put their lines in the sand for now. And that's totally fine. I get it. Again, I've said it 800,000 times. I would have given Hibbs a year or two and a chance because I think I think that there was certainly promise in this season when there was a great opportunity for there not to be when when you consider the circumstances that put Lauren Hibbs on the tag anyway, on the interim tag. So this is all just reaction to it, and now we have to see how it goes. I don't know, and and what's the standard, Paul? Is it you know how how you know we we talk about expectations for men's basketball? What now in a, in a in a almost total reset? What's the expectation for Wichita State baseball in year one, two, three under the new coach? I I don't know what it is. I have no idea. Well, it's going to be championships because that's how this is going to be. I mean, that's how Wichita State baseball. Well, you don't make it, the change if it's not about that. Well, right? that's right. Yes, that that is. But 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 you were asking for a measuring stick. I don't know how Kevin Saul is going to measure up. But maybe maybe there will be a a dollar com, uh, combination of dollars brought in uh, versus uh, uh, games won versus championships won versus uh, bids to the uh, uh, college world series. I don't know. It'll be, be, be something like that, but, but that's the way it needs to be. And obviously whoever, you know, whoever takes the job, whoever does the hiring for, for, for Wichita state baseball. I mean, it's just, it's kind of unfair. And I feel bad for whoever comes in because they're going to be compared to the glory days. I don't know that that's fair to compare Wichita state now to where Wichita state was, Back when they were in the valley and winning championship after championship, Paul, I, I don't think know if that's fair. what's but, happened. I, well, I don't know it, if it's fair, but I don't think you make this change if that's not, you know, that's got to be the expectation. It is the. It expectation. has to be. Well, it there's no way around. The fact is, you've got a national championship and what twenty or thirty up uh, ch uh, championships up on the the stadium every time a person drives down Twenty First Street. They're reminded about the success of Wichita State baseball. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's a beautiful thing, and I love it. But that's the measure. That's the measure. I mean, we can dance around, you know, who's going to be able to get portal guys and who's going to keep portal guys from going into the portal and, and all that. And, and and But it's going to come down to championships. And I don't even mean wins. I mean, you can have some in, – in college baseball, you can win a lot of games and still not win championships. Here in Wichita, it's going to be measured upon championships. That's what it's – that's just that's the nature of the game. If that's not where you want to be as a college baseball coach, and you think that might be, uh, you know, high expectations, maybe too high, then this is not the job well, for that's, you. That you just you just took the words out of my mouth. Let's finish with that. Is that a reasonable expectation? Right. Well, is it? Yes. Is championships You're a reasonable darn expectation? Right it is until proven other. Until we go to that. Well, it's proven is. otherwise the last decade well, since Gene Stevenson left. That That is what's been proven. You, do you think it's going to change over the course of the I next six know. months in a search for a new I baseball? I don't know. I don't think I don't so. Well, not immediately. I not mean, immediately. I think the challenge in year one is no, going to be too you. massive. But, but I don't – I don't. I honestly 
don't know. I don't have a good <laughs> understanding of where it, if it's possible because well, I don't know enough about college baseball behind the scenes. Right. To know if it's possible to get back to that point. But that's you. clearly the expectation or this change would not have been made. I got 869-1240 if you want to weigh in on that. It's still open for you on the IHOP hotline. Uh, Colorado, they coming back to the Big 12? Paul I and I will discuss that. Yeah. There's all kinds of fun and interesting things to, to dive into in college football. Nick Saban thinks the players should unionize. We've got <laughs> Colorado maybe jumping. Uh, scheduling beef in the SEC. Hey, it's almost June. This is where we're headed this summer. 869-1240. The number on that IHOP hotline. We'll be right back.
I want to hear this. Sports Daily is on KFH. Welcome back in, everybody. Sports Daily. Glad to be here with you. Great day. Great Wednesday. Reacting to Lauren Hibbs news still here today. Let's go to the phone lines. Not on Lauren Hibbs, but on a little NBA. Mike on the line wants to chat NBA Finals preview on the IHOP hotline. Mike, welcome into Sports Daily. Hey, thanks. It's cool to be on the air. The Denver Nuggets are well-rested going into the NBA Finals. Their last, their last game against the Lakers was back on May the 22nd. Is that a good thing for the Nuggets going into Game 1 against the Miami Heat tomorrow night? Or could it make the Nuggets players a little bit rusty? I'll hang up and listen to your response. Thanks, guys. Well, Thanks, a- Mike. Paul would tell you it's not a good thing. I don't think Paul it's a good thing. Paul touched on that yesterday. No, no, I don't. I Mike, think, Mike, I don't I think, think it's good. I think if if it's a thing, it will only be a thing for a game. But at that point, Miami's going to be off for a while, too. And they take so much time in between finals games that if it's a thing, which I think there's absolutely a chance it could be, that it will be only a thing at the very beginning of this series. So, like, for game one, and then everyone will be about on the same level as far as that goes. So that would be my thought on it. I think that's a hard thing to predict. I think that comes down to coaching as much as anything else. Paul, what you do between then and... Uh, now and then, or for Denver, what you do for a, a week ago until then, I think matters. We get game one tomorrow night. I think that, you know, it, it's very unpredictable to guess what might happen. I will say if Miami is going to win games in this series, if they're not the massive underdog that they are perceived to be, game one is probably a likely spot for them to get one. For And that's one of the reasons why. But then ultimately, it's, it's you know, if that happens, is Denver have plenty of time and, and ability to adjust to that? I think they do. I absolutely could see this game going 1-0 Miami. Uh, but that doesn't, and that doesn't necessarily mean I think they'll win the series. I don't think they'll win the series. But I could see it go 1-0. I mean, well, I think if they're going to get one, game one's as good a chance as any. Right. But, you know, rhythm is everything in sports. I mean, you've got to get into that rhythm. We hear the sure. word rhythm mentioned all the time. And there's nothing like rhythm. Because once you're in it, then you're in that groove. Uh, it, it's a beautiful thing. I, I I can remember all the years that I have coached at the college level, and inevitably on every season I believe I've ever really coached at the college level, we've had an off week, an off week. Uh, in an off week, most of the teams that I was associated with, we worked the kids with full practices. I mean, we didn't come out and just, you know, uh, shorts and T-shirts and, and, and jog around and do a little bit of running. A lot of times we would take a couple days in that week and we'd put the pads on and we'd go out and we'd run a full practice. And part of that is trying to maintain your rhythm. You got a good rhythm going, you don't want that destroyed. Rhythm is everything in, in, in sports, and it really doesn't matter what sport it is. That's what makes me worry because we're talking about by the time this game is played, I think I'm correct when I say it's going to be nine days. Nine days since Denver has Denver has played. And that's a lot. That's a lot not to uh, to play, to be in that rhythm, to feel that rhythm. You had that rhythm going. I mean, they've been dominant. I mean, Denver's been dominating for the most part, uh, uh, most of the opponents that they've played. So I, I'm just telling you, it, it's – I don't understand uh, why why people don't understand the power of rhythm because it's everything. And rhythm is everything in life. I mean, I mean, Jad Chambers is in a rhythm right now. You ought to see him working this board. He's in a rhythm, and it's a beautiful thing to see. So everything in in life is a rhythm, and you got to be in it. And I hope the Denver Nuggets are in it because, you know, because I have sort of a extra home out in Colorado. I want I want rhythm for the for the uh, Nuggets because I want them to win the series. Yeah, I I, I, I Denver's going to be fine if they lose Game One. And I think game one is as good a chance for Miami to get a game as there is. And it's, yeah, the break has a lot to do with that. I, I don't know how to predict that. Um, you know, the, all, all of this is new for Denver. So I don't know what, what, I don't know what we're, you know, what we're expected to pull from here. It's, it is wide open. Denver is a heavy favorite for a reason. And, you know, I think they've got a, 
a good chance to to get that done. But thanks for the call, Mike, on the IHOP hotline. Great Certainly call. much yeah. more coming on the finals tomorrow as we get ready for game one. Uh, Paul, let's talk and begin to talk and dig into college football, really, uh, when right. we talk about Colorado, because that's what matters for Colorado. It looks like, based on a variety of reports now, that Colorado is – getting things lined up to make the jump to the big 12, if that's what needs to be done. And here we sit now on May 31st with no idea what's going to happen with the PAC 12 TV contract. Now, no matter what happened, I, I just, it seems very unlikely to me that the PAC 12 will be able to both match the big 12 dollars per season, which is just over 30 million per school which by what I've read, Colorado would be, you know, would get because that's a part of the Big 12 agreement is that, you know, money extends to any current Power 5 school that joins the league. If if the Pac-12 can match that, maybe they can. I don't think they can match it on linear television. I think it would be streaming, and I think that's not as attractive to schools. So either way, I, I will predict that the Pac-12 deal is not as good as the current Big 12 deal when you consider both of those things, right? If it's a little better on the money, it won't be as good on where the games are placed, that kind of a thing. Colorado's ready to jump if and when the Pac-12 doesn't do or does whatever it is they're going to do. I, I get the feeling, Paul, and I think you do too, that Colorado is going to come to the Big 12. I mean, the Pac-12 could surprise us. I don't see it. I don't know based on anything that we've seen in this entire process, based on the current state of you know the economy, especially the media economy, where we're seeing network after network cut programming, cut personalities, cut salaries, all of those things that all of a sudden some massive deal is looming for the Pac-12. I think Colorado is going to go. And I think if Colorado goes, you'll get the two Arizona schools at least. Utah is still a part of those conversations, even though they've been the most steadfast in their denials of it. They do still get looped in with those schools. And the Big 12 is going to come out in a really good spot. If they can get any combination of those four schools, it will really, really boost the league. It'll get them into that time zone, which is what Brett Yormark wants. And it just it sure seems like Colorado is going to be the first one to do it. Well, a couple of weeks ago, maybe it was 10 days ago, uh, we saw an article, at least I saw an article. I don't remember if I sent it to you or not. You you probably saw it anyway. And that's that 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 possibly Colorado was going to look at the joining the Big Ten. Well, I, I didn't know that. I that came out of the blue. I hadn't for, seen that one. Yeah, that was that was probably been a couple of weeks ago. Didn't quite make sense, partly because uh I don't believe Colorado State has an at, there's some sort of academic uh they ain't joining the Big Ten. Big yeah. Ten doesn't well, want Colorado. I don't I don't think so either. But uh, and part of it is academic things and credentials that you got to have. Now, Colorado is a great university. It has nothing to do with that. I mean, it's just like the Big Ten. Like if we're talking about if the Big Ten doesn't want Washington and Oregon, the Big Ten doesn't want Colorado. Well, just, one would think there's no chance. But wait a second. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second on that one, big boy. Hold on just a second. If you okay. know, you don't if you don't want Colorado. Well, Colorado has one of the largest cities in the entire Midwest and in the Rocky Mountains and all. I mean, you know, you've got a Denver market. Now, granted, it's a stretch to call Denver a Colorado. I mean, a Col University of Colorado City, because even though it's located in Boulder, which is basically just right there, a suburb of of Denver, uh, it's amazing how little play the University of Colorado gets in in the media. It's a Denver Broncos state is what basically what you have. Not even as much as a as a, uh, a Rockies in baseball or a Nuggets in basketball. It is a Broncos, uh, you know, sports type state. But with that being said, I'm telling you this right now. You can work your way around. I mean, if you put out the the product and you have a great product. And, and it gets the publicity of a great conference, I believe there would be the chance for the University of Colorado to really upgrade its image within its state. And once that image is really upgraded within that state of Colorado, then all of a sudden, you know, the TV viewership becomes more passionate, becomes becomes larger, everything works better. There's a great upside for the University of Colorado with going with a conference like the Big 12 and getting out of the Pac-10. Pac-10! Nobody wants to pack ten. I mean, you, you got listen. How many times, Jacob? And I know, I know you probably are just like me. Oh, that looks like a promising game. Oh, wait a second, it's nine thirty at night. I'm not sure I want to get involved in this really good. Would you match. watch it if Kansas or Kansas State were playing? Yes. Would you watch it if a Big Twelve? Would you, Paul, a Big Twelve consumer, 
watch it if it was a Big 12 game. If it was that late, yes, because it's going to only be once in a while. It's not going to be all that often. Well, no, just in general terms, think about that. Like, we don't watch Pac-12 games at night because why would we care about the Pac-12? This is the great fallacy in college sports, right? There is this desire by some of these leagues to want everybody to be interested in their product. And that is absolutely not going to happen. Never has, never will, right? This is not the NFL. If in football season, because it, and it's, this exists for football. I think it might be different for basketball, by the way. I think we watch more basketball because there's not as much competition with what else is on TV, but during football season, when you've got the NFL and you're already devoting, you know, at least four hours of your Saturday to college football. And then probably for most people, it's most of your Sunday to the NFL. The likelihood that you're also going to mix in a random West Coast game that features teams that have nothing to do with the teams that you consume are low, right? I I think that they are. Now, however, if I'm a Big 12 fan and let's say it's, uh, let's just say for the sake of this that it's Oklahoma State and, and Colorado. All right. And those are two teams in the mix for, uh, you know, in the mix for being in first place in the Big 12. I'm a Kansas State fan. Kansas State's also in the mix, and they're in a three-way tie four or five weeks into the season. You don't think I'm going to watch that game? Because it impacts the team I like. We watch our conferences, right? Our conferences. Right. Some people watch everything. I don't think most people in college football do watch everything, which is always the danger in all of this to me in trying to break out the SEC and the Big Ten to its own thing. Like people, if you did that, people here would not care about that product, right? The playoff will allow everybody to care somewhat for every game that's played, right? That's why that needed to stay in place and why it will make college football as a whole better, quite frankly. But even in this circumstance, I think your mark is right here in his desire to get out there because at the minimum, right? The teams that are playing out there from outside that time zone, those teams fan bases will watch. But I think even bigger than that, the majority of fans that watch that league regularly will watch. And the big 12's footprint is bigger than, you know, the rest of the country wants to admit big 12 fans are very loyal and they watch games. And they go to games, Paul. That's the other thing. Attendance is great in the Big 12. So, yes, it makes sense to me because it's getting you into another window. And it makes sense from a network perspective, too, because now you're bringing. Let's let's just hypothesize here for a second. If Colorado, Arizona, if we got those four corner schools into the Big 12. All right. I would venture to guess that the ratings for West Coast games would go up. Time zone, West Coast time zone games would go up Pacific time, whatever you want to call it, would go up because you're you're bringing a whole new fan base into that. And it would, you know, like if if it's a game that matters to Kansas State or Kansas for me, like I'm probably tuning into that game. If even if it starts at nine o'clock. That's that's my prediction. I think your mark's right, and I think his desire to get some schools out there to keep that time zone is a very smart one. And in basketball, Paul, I think it's a new frontier. I think we'll watch basketball more because if, if he can pull off what I think the end game is with basketball, I'm telling you, man, it's going to create an NBA light that is is attractive, right? Yeah. Because we're not consuming that all the time like we do with football. Right. Who doesn't want to go see KU and K-State play at the University of Arizona? And you will watch. Now, now, sure. but we're only talking about a one-hour time difference, I think. Now, I, I think there's some differences in Arizona on how that works. I don't. Arizona's wanna, I, weird, yeah. yeah. Sometimes they're sometimes they're mountain, and sometimes yes. they're Pacific. But for the most part, we're talking about teams that are going. But to it be still gets one, you. It, we're talk, we need to talk more about TV windows than we do, you know, actual times because right. it only matters to the TV window, right? And I and I defer to you on that stuff. You're the expert on TV. Well, and all. so Arizona's. It doesn't matter what time zone Arizona's in. They're going to play in a nine o'clock here or eight thirty window, right. regardless of whether it's you know ten seven thirty or eight thirty there. But like all, it doesn't matter. But all potential. All, all that matters is the network, right? But all the potential sponsors that would sponsor 
big Big 12 basketball, football, whatever the case might be, are going to want those Arizona markets. They're huge. They're growing. Sure. They're popular. The Utah. Well, who doesn't want Phoenix and Denver and Salt Lake City? Who Some doesn't? Great markets. I mean, I, 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 want, yeah. I want them right now. I wish this could be taken care of by the end of the week. That's what I hope. I well, I, I, it's coming very fast. I mean, the Pac-12 is on the hot yeah. seat still, and they just keep dragging their feet. It's going to bite them in the butt. I mean, yeah. they they waited too well, long. That's interesting. Brett Yormark made that move early. Everybody made fun of him, and now look where now look who's laughing. One of these days, six nine twelve forty. I was just going to say, that's, one of these days, I'm going to ask you the question. Well, what's going to happen to Washington, Washington State, Oregon, Oregon State? What's going to happen to Cal? What's going to happen? They'll to, all be uh, fine. Washington mean, State and Oregon State. Washington State and Oregon State are, are in the similar situation to where Kansas State and Texas Tech and some of the others were a couple years well, ago. Boy, that's it's pretty it's close. uneasy. Yes. yes. It's uneasy in those that's, places right now. Right. 869-1240, the IHOP hotline. We'll come back. More Sports Daily. All Brockton Savage right after this.
Let's do this thing. Go! Sports Daily is on KFH. Use a BetMGM bonus bet to place your next wager on any game in any sport. To receive your bonus bet, simply log into your BetMGM account every Saturday and Wednesday between May 13th through June 7th to bet on any game of your choice. Then add any type of bet on any game to your first uh, to your bet slip and activate your bonus bet. There is no deposit or additional wager required. Want even more BetMGM action? Enjoy the best daily promotions, live betting options, and the all-new signature bets. Only at BetMGM. BetMGM and GameSense remind you to play responsibly and offer resources to help you make appropriate choices. Promotion may differ per customer. BetMGM.com for T's and C's, 21 plus, and physically present in Kansas to bet. Existing customer offer. All promotions are subject to qualification and eligibility requirements. Rewards issued as non withdrawable bonus bets. Bonus bets expire seven days from issuance. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 522 4700 in partnership with Kansas Crossing Casino and Hotel. Welcome back into Sports Daily, everybody. Jacob Albrock, Paul Savage here with you on this Wednesday. Tommy will be back next week. Uh, a dad times two now. As Tommy's out taking care of that new baby. He'll be back with you next week with Paul. Savage, we got NBA Finals starting tomorrow. We've touched on Lauren Hibbs and that decision and now the fallout and the player roster, and you're seeing some of the reaction to that um, on social media. Lots of uh, Lots of reaction and you know, moving into the transfer portal happening there for the baseball program. It is an interesting, it is uh, it is a very interesting time for Wichita State baseball in a decision that has not been taken lightly, I don't think by the roster clearly, or by the fans. And we'll see um, what, you know, what happens next. I don't know how quickly a search will happen here as we're just beginning NCAA regionals in baseball. So are any candidates currently coaching? I, I don't know the answer to that. And, and, you know, when you look at it, as you look toward the next coach, there there will be a, you know, there will be a bit of a, you know, it's not Gene Stevenson all over again. Don't want to be overly dramatic, but there will be some, you know, I think animosity built in for, for people that really would have liked to see Lauren Hibbs get this job. But when you look for a baseball coach, Paul, in this day and age, what what are you looking for, do you think? Well, obviously, a man who can... First and foremost, get kids through college, get them degrees, and that kind of thing. Sure. That's what I'm going to say right off the get-go. But with that being said, and that was an obvious qualification, you're looking for a guy who knows baseball and a guy who knows particularly college baseball and a guy who can recruit and a guy who can know how to use NIL and a guy who, who can know how to use a portal uh, to his advantage, not his disadvantage. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for a name, and it's going to be a, a good name. Because Wichita State is a job that pays, I'm assuming, as good as most jobs anywhere in the country. So it's going to be a good job. But the upside at Wichita State is so great. You're playing in a great conference. Now, I know you're going to throw into my face February baseball. Well, you know something? February turns into March, and March turns into April. And that's when when fans start showing up, and I get that. But I can tell you right now, this is a, this is a job – that will be coveted by a lot of people. There's going to be quality name coaches who want this job. I'm convinced of that. As rightfully so, they should. And uh, but this is this is the kind of guy that that they're going to want. They're going to want a name. They're going to want somebody who's proven themselves. I don't think this is a job where you're going to say, I'm going to take a guy who was first base coach for five years at such and such school, even though it was a big name school. That's not the way it's going to be. It's going to be a big name on his own. I think that's the way it's going to go. What about you, Jacob? I have no idea. I have no idea. I really don't. Don't have a clue. I got nothing for you. I mean, Oral Roberts has a coach who's been highly successful. You want to go back to Oral Roberts and hire your next coach? I, I really don't know. Like, I don't I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. Hopefully somebody that can recruit. I mean, I'd start there. Graduating, yes, that's important, obviously. But I find somebody that can recruit. Um, talent was there on this roster. It and was. Most of it's leaving. So we'll see. 869-1240. We'll come back. We'll get back into the college sports conversation. Nick Saban with an interesting take on things. Uh, we'll get into that as we return with more Sports Daily. Hour number two, Albrockton Savage on a Wednesday. We'll be right back.
Wake up all brought. Tommy Castor. This is Sports Daily on Wichita's number one sports radio, 97.5 and 1240 KFH. Welcome back in, everybody. Sports Daily. It's all Brockton Savage. Glad to be here with you. Thanks to those who are listening to us on KFH, maybe on the uh, Odyssey app via KFH. 869-1240 is the IHOP hotline. Thanks to those who are watching us as well. Uh, You got us on Facebook. You got us on YouTube. You got us on Twitter. I'm jealous of Paul's Hawaiian today. I'm a big Hawaiian fan myself. Uh, appreciate that, Paul. Appreciate uh, you, bet. you know, wearing the season. You got to celebrate. <laughs> That's uh, exactly yeah. right. Hey, we never, Paul, you just sent me this, and you're exactly right because it happened over the weekend. Adrian Griffin. Man, what a congratulations going out to Adrian Griffin, brand new Wichita Sports Hall of Fame member, and almost, Paul, as cool as being a Wichita Sports Hall of Fame member, now an NBA head coach. Uh, Griffin takes over the Bucks job. What a fantastic landing spot. What a fantastic opportunity. Uh, we talked to him about that a couple of weeks ago when he was inducted into the Wichita Sports Hall of Fame, and he has earned this spot greatly. Wichita's own, one of Wichita's finest. Can't wait to see how he does there, and we think he's just going to knock it out of the park. Right. So congratulations wow. to you know Wichita uh, legend Adrian Griffin on that. On by that the, promotion by the way, and that opportunity. By the way, just real quick, I'm trying to think if we ever had a professional football coach, basketball coach, baseball manager, uh, at uh, Hawk, maybe even a, if you want to count hockey, uh, a, a a Wichita native become the head coach in at the major league level, and I don't think so. I'm sitting here thinking and I would know uh, because it'd probably already be in the Wichita Sports Hall of Fame. But congratulations to uh, Adrian, because I think that makes him the very first Wichita native to ever get the head job at one of the uh, major sports uh, franchises in the history of Wichita. I think that is so cool. And he's a genuine guy. I like him a lot. I know you do, too. And, boy, don't we wish him the best. We, sh- I am now a Milwaukee Buck fan. How about that? Oh, who's not? Yeah, I mean, who's not? If you're around here, yeah, of course. I mean, it's it, you get Giannis there. You get a roster that's really good. Fantastic opportunity. We're really, really yep. excited for Adrian Griffin. Thanks for mentioning he, it, though. I, I, thank yeah, you so much. He appreciates great it. Great opportunity. You know, it had happened. Right, right. Uh, you know, at, 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 you know, just just cool. And, and Joe, on our video stream, points out Eric Wedge to you, Paul, but Eric Wedge is not from Wichita. No, no, he's not from Wichita. He played baseball at Wichita State. Right. Paul is talking about people from Wichita that have made been a pro sports head coach. So uh, very cool there. All right, Paul, let's talk about this story. So Nick Saban, they've got the SEC meetings, which means you're going to get all kinds of content, right? SEC meetings. It's this thing that we follow because we, we can't get enough football. Nick Saban... Uh, thinks that the players could unionize and it would be good for the sport. I don't disagree with that at all. I think Nick Saban, though, (laughs) I think his line of thinking on this with all of this has been very interesting over the years. So Nick Nick Saban thinks that unions would help parity and it would control spending, right? That's the bottom line is it would control spending because they could put in a salary cap. Now, Paul, while this comes across is a pro player opportunity, and he doesn't think there's anything wrong with universities paying players, that part I agree with him on. But when you talk about unionization, it, it you know on the surface you're like, oh, cool, Saban's very pro player. But let's get to the heart of this because I don't buy it. He wants that so we can get a salary cap. Why does he want a salary cap? Because other teams now are spending as much or more than Alabama. And while he can say there is no parity in the sport, that's not true. TCU just played in a national championship game. San Diego state just played in a national championship game in two sports where that doesn't normally happen. So the parity is happening at a different level than it ever has. Yes. The spending is not equal, which is a problem. All the schools and administrators want to fix, right? Because 
they can't control this and they're being outspent and they don't want to have to spend more. I don't want to take this as this noble idea from Nick Saban because, yes, pay the players. That sounds great. But he wants to do that so that he can put in a salary cap, Paul, and keep these other schools from spending more than he spends on players. Let's let's not beat around the bush on this. And there's also the fact that why he would be for that would be, you know, you just can't willy nilly go to another school either. I mean, you're going to you're going to keep kids from going. You're going to be under contract. You're going to be under contract, in other words, because that's sort of what goes with being unionized. And uh, when you when you are unionized, you know, your options become fewer and fewer with regards, where can I go? Where can I play my sport? What can I do? How much time will I have left? There's all kinds of, of issues that could, could come up. But the point is, is that if you unionize, and when you say, even if everybody's playing with parity, once you have the advantage, and Alabama has an advantage, but once you have that advantage, it's got to be taken away from you in a, in a, in a factor that makes everybody equal. Man, that's hard to do. Because right now, Nick Saban and his staff is able to sit in anybody's living room and say, not only are you going to make a lot of money coming to Alabama, we're going to give you the max money that our union will allow us to give you. We're going to get you the training and what you need to become that great NFL player. And that's huge. Because after all, how many Alabama players usually go in the first round? Well, it's numerous usually. How many go in the entire draft? A bunch. And how many guys from Alabama are playing in the NFL right this very moment? Tons. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that Nick Saban would have advantages no matter what, even with the unionization. He's going to continue to have those, those advantages just because that will then make ground that can needs to be made up very hard to achieve, difficult to get. And so you just can't have it both ways. You Paul. can't have it both ways. That's you're either you're either going to let this thing be the free and open market, or you're going to treat it like a pro sports league. Right. So you you don't get to have both, right? It, it, people like Nick Saban are uncomfortable with this open market because it has leveled the playing field. Make no mistake, it has leveled the playing field. We just saw TCU reach a national championship game made largely up of transfer portal players. That doesn't sit well with the juggernauts who have had this stranglehold on recruiting for, you know, with the better part of two decades now. That doesn't sit well with them. They would much rather those players come to their school and be stuck there than to see those players leave for a better opportunity, Paul. Right, right. Sometimes and so if you're if you're going to do that. You'd better pay them and put them under contract. And I think that's what Saban's hinting right. at. He would rather see that, yeah, right? right? He'd rather see, you know, a, a level playing field and how much that can be spent to see those players stay right where they're at. Right. And, and, and okay, if you want to do that, go for it. But you better be ready for the most complicated negotiations of all time. Mm -hmm. Because how do you evaluate it? How do you get college kids and, and so many different athletes? And do you just unionize college football? Do you have to unionize all college athletics now? Do you have to unionize it across all conferences? Is this just an SEC thing? How do you determine a salary cap? Who determines a salary cap? Players, guess what? If they unionize, have to agree to that salary cap. Why, Paul, do you think we'll never see a salary cap in Major League Baseball? Right. You think that's because the owners don't want a salary cap or the players don't want oh, a salary cap? I, that's almost a crazy question. But yes, I get it. Right. So, so you cannot have it both ways. Either you go down that very slippery, complicated, almost impossible slope because of the differences, right? You know, when you're in the NFL and you talk about a salary cap, you've got to get a certain number of players on a certain number of teams to just agree. And it's not nearly as difficult as the thought of trying to get all college athletes across all conferences to agree on something that's never going to be equitable. Why would a salary cap for Kansas state be the same as a salary cap for Alabama? It wouldn't be right. So do you lower the salary cap for Alabama to reach the threshold other schools could spend at, or do you raise it up and understand that none of the other schools are going to be able to spend at that level anyway, which is essentially what we have except it caps the big spenders, right? So from Nick Saban's perspective, when he mentions Texas and Texas A&M and 
Why is that? Because they can spend like Alabama can spend. He'd rather see them capped, Paul. Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean where you can put that cap though. Right. You can cap Alabama. Cause you better believe he's not going to sign off with capping Alabama. He's mm -hmm. going to, he wants to cap the other schools to where Alabama's at, but Kansas state's never going to reach that cap. Right? right. You know, like Colorado's never going to reach that cap. So what do you do here? Do you do it by conference? Okay. Maybe, but now you're unionizing and, and do you do it across all sports? Are volleyball players going to have a say in what football players can earn in this player's union? It is not that simple. The simplest way is to have the free market as it currently stands. And it is a wild west. And that's not, you know, the best solution. But it is right now the answer to me that is the most achievable. I am all for paying players and making them employees of universities. I've said that for years and years and years and years. Oh my goodness, will that be insanely complicated to achieve? Right. If you think NIL is tough to manage, I can't even fathom trying to do that. Right. You mind if I build on what you have just said? I, I, I want to, because it's a really great point. With unions, and I think you, you would agree with this, with unions comes management of unions. And most unions that I'm aware of ha come under the scrutiny of, of, some sort of employment boards from the federal government. Most unions are governed and have rules and are, are basically policed by government entities. I don't even, I, I guess it's the union, whatever, depends on who's governed, what, but however that works. But if you go ahead and unionize, you're going to have layer after layer after layer looking over this thing, answering to certain people. Right now, I think the wild, wild west with NIL looks better than a union. Because unions come with a lot of baggage with regards to who's going to oversee those who are cheating. Who's going to put penalties on those who are cheating. Who's going to do a lot of things when it comes to what's going to go on and how they how a union is managed. And uh, that worries me. That worries me. It doesn't worry Nick Saban because he'll probably have a lot of his buddies on the union boards and all that kind of thing. But it does worry me. Right now, I think it's better off. And and Jacob, just to just to refresh your memory, I know we talked about it. I'm sure you remember it. Remember the dust up about a year ago? It was about this time, about one year ago, that uh, Jumbo Fisher and Nick Saban had Jumbo Fisher yeah. from Texas A&M. This Jimbo, is all. Yeah. This was all about recruiting. Remember that? And we were still learning about NIL. There was a lot of questions that that a year ago. There were a lot of things we still didn't know about uh, NIL. But we're starting to figure a lot out. We're starting to get an understanding for it. And now, as it turns out, which I was not quite aware, I kind of thought it might be an argument about money. And it turns out, well, it was just about overall Blake money of buying players. Wasn't quite aware of that. Thought it might be last year. Now we're aware. We believe that is the case. Because it turns out, Jumbo Fisher had the largest budget. You, call it, buy you can call it buying players all you want, Paul. Uh it's paying players. The open market is determining what a player is worth. It's not buying players. It's well, compensating players. Like I, I don't understand that. Like you pay for play and buying and all these terms, people, these scary terms people want to use. No, it's compensation for a player based on what the market is telling them that they're worth. If boosters, if businesses, if anybody wants to step in and say, this player is worth this to us, then that is what that player's worth. That is capitalism. Okay? True. Like, True. we don't have these, we like, if, if Paul, if I'm, and I can't do this because I'm under contract, right? I'm under contract and, and I can't do these things, but let's just say I'm anybody walking down the street. Let's say I'm an accountant, right? Okay. And, you know, some, you know, this would never happen, but just somebody that's a huge fan of the accountant of the accounting firm across the street. Okay. Not the business itself. All right. Right. Okay. Wants to come up to me and I'm not under contract. I'm just getting paid as I work. Right. Right. Somebody says, man, we really want you to come here. Here's a signing bonus. Okay. Is there anything wrong with that? No, there's what nothing if that, wrong what if with that, that signing, what if that signing bonus was $2 million? Cause I was that good at what I did. 
No, I don't have a problem with anything. It. Anything wrong with that? I didn't even study. I'm, be, no, I'm being. I'm being paid to play. You're, I'm being bought. Well, no, like we had, all live in that world, but right. we don't want these athletes. So it makes no sense whatsoever. Why is it a problem? Well, I don't know that it is a problem. And it and but and, everybody wants to paint this picture that this Wild West is so crazy and, and such a problem. But when push comes to shove, did you watch any less college football, college basketball last year than you normally do, Paul? No, maybe even more. Possibly yeah. even more. Yeah. If you're a fan of TCU, if you're a fan of Kansas State with the class that just came in, if you're a fan of Kansas basketball with the class that just came in, you got any problem? with some of that roster construction and the fact that it came through NIL opportunities? Heck no. Are you kidding me? No. So Absolutely. where is this perceived problem? Like, where is it? I, that's that. Let's get to the bottom of this. All right. Let, me give, you, let me give you the perceived where bottom. Where is the problem? There's going to be agricultural schools like Oklahoma State, the University of Kansas, Mississippi State, and I use Mississippi State because they have a big ag ag agriculture program at their university. There's going to be certain universities that will not have near the funds to be able to, I mean, in a, in a real world, I mean, not that Mississippi state's poor, K state's poor, but, but to compete with the university of Mississippi in their state to compete with Alabama in their league, Kansas, uh, uh, Kansas state competing with uh, the, whoever has the most money here in, in the big 12 as it reshapes yeah. and reforms. Yeah. There, uh -huh. there can be, there can be, some inconsistencies and there could be some perceived uh, uh, inabilities to compete on a financial level. That's the nature of the game. But guess Paul, what? Everybody Paul, I want to ask you an honest, I want to ask you an honest question, please, please. Before, before NIL, did Kansas state and Mississippi state have a chance to compete with Alabama? No, not, not in the sense that I think you mean, no. not in the sense no. I think you mean. Yes. They I, weren't I competing right. with Alabama no, anyway. No, okay, that, yes. Are they are they farther or closer? Is Kansas State in 2023 farther or closer than they were to competing with Alabama in 2015? You know, that's a weird way. That's a weird question because, and I'm going to put it this way. You got me on that one. That's a heck of a point. By the way, that's going to be a best of point right there, Jad. Uh, NIL sure has leveled the playing they field. They have leveled. Of that's course. That's a great point. Of and, of course. Good point. Well, it, no, no, it's some a good point. schools well, are some going schools. to be able to compete with others for some schools. at a higher level. Right. For but some Paul, schools. Paul, along with this has come the transfer portal and through NIL opportunities and the transfer portal. And I am totally okay, by the way, with the portal limitations. But along with that, you have now this, this opportunity for some of these schools who know they can't spend with Alabama, but what they can do is provide an opportunity and a pretty attractive offer to some really talented players who weren't able to get on the field. And that's what Nick Saban doesn't like. Right. That's what he doesn't want to see. Right. Nick Saban. Because that does level the playing field. That's how TCU just made a national championship game. Right. And Nick Saban has second team offensive linemen. He doesn't want playing for anybody else, does he? Exactly. Because they're darn good and probably would start at nine out of ten schools in his conference. His second team offensive line would start for anybody else in the conference. So, so don't confuse Nick Saban as this benevolent force who's interested in anything other than getting the playing field back to where he wants it. Well, I don't okay? think I did like, that. Like, for no. real. <laughs> I didn't I, do that. And, and, that's what, and that's how this is being painted. Oh, Nick Saban's pro-union. Look at him. He's so pro-player. No, he's pro-salary cap. He, wa he wants a union so he can get a salary cap, okay? And what that does is limit what the other schools can pay so that he doesn't have to pay as much to keep up with the – I'm telling you. Like, call me a conspiracy theorist all you want. There's no benevolent nature in wanting this that because he wants a salary cap and he doesn't want these other places to be able to do what they're doing right now because it evens the playing field with Alabama, period. Why do you think he keeps bringing up Texas A&M? Well, part of the reason he brings up Texas A&M so often is because, first of all, I don't think him and Jumbo like each other. Because they're real. spending but, more but for players. They're spending, actually, technically, more than Alabama's spending. 
That's and what that, I'm saying. And that bugs that's why he keeps bringing him up. He's, that's so, why he keeps bringing him up. Yeah. Let, play, lay, I, I've said it from day one, and it, this will this will level the playing field. And the argument has always been, well, how is Kansas State going to keep up with Alabama and how much they can pay their players? The answer is they're not going to, and they never were. They weren't keeping up with Alabama before. But what they can do now and what some schools can do now is take the players that weren't getting an opportunity to Alabama to come play there, and NIL allows them to do it. So yeah. say whatever you want. You can be pro, you know, Nick Saban, pro union. Oh, look at him. He's he's for the player. No, he's not. He's for a salary cap. He's not. If you're for the players, you want the players to earn as much as they can possibly earn. Now, do you need to figure out a way to get some, you know, administrative control on NIL to protect players from shady characters? I fully will buy that. I, I get that piece of it, understand it, and, and I'm good with it. But Paul, as this has played out, I have no issue with this open market system. I don't. I, I it's It has, to me, it has leveled the playing field. We just saw two teams that five, six, seven years ago reach a national championship game. And, and college basketball is a little bit different because it's a tournament format. So let's, maybe maybe that's not even fair. But in football, we've seen Cincinnati and we've seen TCU go places that teams don't typically go that aren't brand names in college football. So don't tell me the, you know, don't tell me the disparity's not there. It's there. It's as much there now as it ever has been. And it's going to get better with an expanded playoff. So is it perfect? No, but don't misunderstand power players wanting limitations on this and why that is the case. It's because they they need things to be back the way they were. It was easier in those times. It was easier when Nick Saban wasn't getting outbid for a player. He doesn't like that. He doesn't like that Texas A&M might come in and pay another player more than he's going to pay. That makes him uncomfortable. You know, that hasn't been the model. It's not pro player. Pro player is to facilitate players earning as much as they're possibly able to earn and as much as the market wants to dictate they earn. You can call it whatever you want to call it pay to play, whatever. But the reality is the rest of society doesn't live that way. If a company wants to come in and pay you a whole bunch of money because they think that you are so good at what you do and are valuable potentially to them, they have every right to do it and we would never fault anybody for doing. But with college athletes, that's not okay. It's, it's insane. It's insanity. It is. Well, I think that's that, I think that's an excellent point. And there are all kinds of things about unionizing that you may not like. Unions can have a way of tapping down on the top salaries for these players and what it'll be there. Well, that's a, and that's OK. Like if they want if they want to, because it's not like a, you know, a, a plumber's union and a player's union, I don't think are the same thing. Right. And so it, it's just I don't know how a union would ever be possible because there's so much of a difference between. Uh, athletes of different sports. I don't know how they would do that. I, I don't know how it's even achievable. I mean, you could try. If they want to try, go for it. But but the problem is going to be with a union comes a salary cap. And and maybe a union can bring, bring the bottom up somehow. And maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. Maybe it would be good for athletes of other sports. I have no idea. But let's let's just realize why pro leagues have salary caps, right? That's not a That's not a pro player thing, right? You think... You don't think the Dallas Cowboys would spend more for players if there wasn't a salary cap in place? Oh, well, the salary cap benefits the the teams, not the players. That's why you'll never see one in Major League Baseball. They'll never sign off on it. That's right, and and the teams understand that this could get out of hand very very quickly in the in the arms race. I say the arms race of signing players to uh, to to become you know champions. And you've got guys. There are certain guys in the NFL that you know are billionaires. I mean billionaires. Don't think they couldn't buy buy an NFL uh, championship. Uh, of course they could. So your point's well taken. The only thing that that I would like to say uh, as we as we wrap this segment up is that if you unionize, there's going to be a lot more downside for these players. And I think these players are going to end up being smart enough to understand that there's going to be downsides to the union. Right now, uh, you can sign with anybody for whatever amount that you can negotiate, and that's where you're at right now. 
And uh, now there, that's not to say that there's not going to be some innate problems as we go on. And I think we're going to eventually see some rivalries within programs over somebody's making this amount and I'm not. And offensive linemen aren't making as much as the quarterbacks and the receivers. And I think, our next, our next, uh, uh, you know, problems that we have with NIL, we're going to see with inside teams, with inside how much people are getting, because not everybody's getting the same. Uh, not everybody contributes the same to the success on the field either. That's for sure. I don't know, but it's going to. But you either go free market, Paul, or you don't. You're yeah, either yeah, worth what the market says you are, yeah. or you don't. I mean, they're two very different things. You can't have both. Can't have both. Can't right have either. both. Yep. Yep. You're right. Eight six nine twelve forty is the number to call. You can react to that. We'll get to some comments on it as we make our way through. The IHOP hotline is open. Eight six nine twelve forty. It's all Brockton Savage rolling through a Wednesday. We'll be right back.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Sports Daily, KFH. It's all Brockton Savage. Andrew chimes in on our video stream via YouTube that the open market setup is suboptimal. What is the optimal setup, then, in our opinion, for compensating student-athletes appropriately? Um, I, I think we're getting there, Paul. I've always thought this would take four or five years to settle out. I, I don't know how else you do it besides the open market unless you make every single athlete an employee and pay them, and then they're agreeing to that salary just like the rest of us do, and then they're under contract. I don't know how else you do that. Um, I, I just And I don't know that that's optimal because I don't know that that seems very complicated. I think that the open market is a path. I think that I, I think the bigger issue is coming in the transfer angle of this and the tampering. If you want to put tampering rules in place, go for it because that is a little shady, right? Don't reach out to players until they're into the portal. And if you're caught doing that, you're limited by scholarships or whatever it is you want to do. Well, but I don't know that there's a better way than the open market. And if you also want to, within the open market, limit the number of just wide open and free penalty free transfers. I'm also okay with that as long as you get one, which is the which is now the system. I think that will I think that's going to make a very large difference um, that we'll see pretty quickly. So I think we're getting to what's a pretty good spot in this. And again, here's the other thing, Paul. In the current system, and we didn't talk about this in the last segment. In the current system, how much do universities have to pay? These players, because if you want to bring them on as employees, now you've got the university on the hook for that. So I don't understand also why why the NCAA has its new president lobbying in Washington to get something in place here that potentially. Here's the most dangerous thing for colleges in the NCAA. Revenue sharing. You want a union, Nick Saban, you ready to revenue share? Because that's that's the big elephant in the room. The NCAA basketball tournament, which is worth billions, how much of that do the players get currently? Zero. So if if you think that that's the path, that cannot be the best answer for the schools because now the $30 million that Big 12 schools are getting in football, how much of that do they keep and how much goes to the players in yeah. a revenue-sharing model? Right. Right now they get to keep all of it. Right. And the players are compensated by somebody else. It, you, you've got this model, Paul. Could you imagine? I'm a business owner. I, I'm trying to like envision this world where I hire people to come work for me. And I'm like, here's and here's the thing. Like, I'm not going to pay you. Somebody else is going to pay you. I don't. And then I don't have to pay you. Could you imagine that? That's the model they're currently in. That sounds like a pretty sweet deal for schools. And in the NCAA, you don't have to share any of that revenue that's generated. That sound good to you for your business? Yeah, it does to me. Why are you poking that bear? Right. Yeah, Nick Saban, do you want to? How much do you? How much are you willing to give up of your profit to Vanderbilt here in your conference? You're going to give them some of how your. How much money. are you willing to give up to your profit to your own players? Yeah, because that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, and, and and therein lies part of the problem with with what what you're. This will all figure out. And it will all sort of take shape now because I'm going to look back over the past year. Do you remember about a year ago, about this time on this show, we broke news that nobody had ever broken in, in Wichita media. And that was basically how much K state KU were playing individual players here in the city of Wichita and in the state of Kansas to attend their schools. Remember when we broke that news and we were really surprised at the amounts and how much it was. Turns out that, that those amounts have gone up rather quickly, uh, and those amounts are much larger than they were a year ago. But we broke that news. We didn't know where this was going. We didn't know how this was going to tape shape. We didn't know who this was going to advantage and who it wasn't. And it was obvious the amounts were different between KU and K-State. KU was paying a lot more money, really, to players to, to sign with them, and, and that's what we reported, and that's what really the, the, the situation was. But there's still so much ground, Jacob, that's going to happen. There's so many changes that are taking place. Man, we 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 talk about this almost once a week just because there's changes and we got to keep up with the changes. And the changes 
K-State's got to keep up with the changes from Oklahoma. And Oklahoma has to keep up the changes from Alabama and Georgia. And Georgia and, and Alabama have to figure out ways. How can we keep the players we got and not let the other teams have them so that they get better? It's just it's it's a vicious cycle, but you know who ends up, you know who who ends up ahead, the players. They're going to end up ahead. That's who's going to end up ahead. Well, they're going to end up ahead of where they were, which was this ridiculous place, right, where they couldn't do anything. They well, couldn't go earn. You couldn't yeah. go. Uh, I, I was talking to Dennis Dodd this weekend when I was doing the CBS shift, and and he used an example of a musician. I think it was at Arizona State that he was doing a story with, who couldn't go with his peers who were going to play like Carnegie Hall. Right. As a as a music student, he couldn't go do that as an athlete. He wasn't allowed to do it because he was an athlete. Right. And it's ridiculous. Right. It's absolutely ridiculous. Right. And so, I and I have told you the story of going on a road trip watching my daughter play uh, NCAA volleyball. And during during uh, breaks uh, when other teams are playing, my daughter come over with one or two. Uh, of her player friends and say, you know, we're going to, uh, I'm going to go over to the concession stands. Girls, let, what can I get you? You want a Coke or anything? Oh, thank you, Mr. Savage. But we can't accept, we can't accept uh, any kind of money typed offer from anybody. I couldn't buy my daughter's teammates a Coke at the concession stand. That's nuts. That's crazy. But that was the rules and nobody's going to break the rules and make sure you don't. And uh, uh, so we got, we're away from that. Thank goodness. But, I'll tell you a story yeah, on how ridiculous what. that was. So when I right before I left Amarillo, legendary coach at West Texas A&M named Don Carthel was there, had brought the program to new levels, not seen. I mean, we're talking, Paul, drawing like 20,000 fans for a Division II football game. Like, people were nuts about it. Right. And except the athletic director. And he was fired because of this. They were in Dallas, in the Dallas area for the conference meetings. And he was with two players and they got done early and they wanted to go to a Rangers game. And so he took the players. They didn't have any money on them because they're college athletes at a division two program. Nobody has any money. No. And he said, I'll get your tickets. You got to pay me back, though, when we get back to Canyon, Texas. So he had pay me back. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll front it to you now so we can get into this game. And then you guys just pay me back when we get there. So that happens. He got fired for that. Wow. He got fired for that. Wow. Yeah. And, and you're talking about a legend, a legend whose son now has won a division two national championship is now at Stephen F. Austin. Like it's insane. That's, and that's why he was fired. And I, I just like, that's where we were, right? That's, that's what we were dealing with before. You can't get your, your, you know, a uh, uh, beverage at the concession stand while you're watching your daughter and her teammate. Like, this is stupid. Like, what are we doing here? So that was before. We're better than that now, right? We're better than that. Is it wild and crazy and uncontrolled and uncomfortable? Yes. Will it get better? Yes. It's, get, it's going to get better. Now, the real question, though, becomes, what do you think better is? Is better athletes making less money? Or is better just having more organizational control on the facilitation of the money, regardless of what it is, right? Like, I am totally fine helping facilitate this stuff. What I'm not fine with is anything that tries to put a stranglehold on what, what the open market is determining some of these athletes are worth. That's what I'm not okay with, because that's not any of, of anybody's business. Right. Like, I, you know, it, it's just you've got you've got restrictions on scholarship and academic requirements and all of that stuff needs to be there. One hundred percent. But the school for any other student on campus isn't stepping in to say X, Y, Z student can't go work for a certain amount of money. It's It doesn't happen because it's total nonsense. Yet we accept it for athletes. Could you imagine, Paul? Let's say you're like a an acting student. You're a thespian, Paul. Let's say you're, uh, what it was, say you're 20 years old. You're a, you know, you're an acting student at Baylor and Hollywood comes calling and wants to cast you for a movie, pay a million bucks. We're going to cast you in this movie. We want you to be the star. 
It, do we do you then as an acting student have to make some decision where you give up your college eligibility as an actor to go take that job or, you know, like, no, you just go take the job and you're still an acting student. Yeah, that's right. You come right back and you're back in class and back in performances and at uh, at the theater there. Isn't it crazy that we've done this for athletes and we've brainwashed people to think it's OK? Well, and, like it, that that concept doesn't exist for anybody else. Well, it, it, your point is excellent with with regards to the uh, theater because it it does point it out. Part, but those that would defend it would say, "Well, this is part of the way we control gambling. This is this is part of the way that we're able to clamp down a little bit and uh, not allow students to take." Uh, any kind of bribe that 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 might be used against them later for some particular game that some you know gambling organization would 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 then call upon that that's what they're going to say and at at one point i think um i'm only i don't even know that they even had a point on that i i'm not you know something I, i'm not even going to buy i was going to say maybe i could see that a little bit but you know no, something i'm no. not sure i see it at all no. i take it back i don't see anything I'm gambling on, or no gambling, gambling if that no scenario gambling. exists. That's right. And it I'm not buying And it. it doesn't. You could make the case that some booster of another school would pay some kid and just be like, don't play well. Like, that doesn't even have to be gambling. Like, I, I, that, that, that stuff is so far-fetched and out of anybody's control that, like, what are we even talking about at that point? It's just I, – I, it does not make any sense. And, and we have now this path. For athletes to earn as much as they're worth, it doesn't cost these schools or the NCAA a penny, right? They don't have to give up any of their revenues in this. Why are you messing with this? Nick Saban, you want to give up some of the bonus you get if if Alabama wins a national championship? You want to you want to distribute that out to your players? <laughs> yeah. Come talk to me. Yeah, really. Yeah, really. I mean, come on now. You're making let's, eight let's million dollars here. a year. Eight million a year. Come on. I don't even care about his salary. I'm just well, talking about his incentive yeah. bonus. Uh, oh, just yeah, your well, incentive yeah, bonus. Yeah, I got just you. give that up. Yeah, how about that? Why is it okay that Nick Saban makes eight million dollars a year? By the way, because that's what the market says he's worth. Yeah. That's what the school says he's worth. Right. Great. Make a hundred million dollars a year. I don't care. Somebody's willing to pay you. Yeah. But have the same standard for your players. Yeah. Please. That's the same. Eight six nine twelve forty. I mean, it's going to be, that's all it is. Is it? We'll be right back. More Sports Daily. The IHOP hotline's open if you want to chat about it. Uh, again, Nick Saban says players need to unionize. Don't, don't misunderstand. It's because he wants a salary cap. We'll be right back with more Sports Daily. <laughs>
Welcome back in, everybody. Sports Daily, all Brockton Savage. Got me fired up, Paul, on this college football, oh, college you athletics yeah, compensation I thing. I just, I sense that. A little, a little pick me up here, a little caffeine. How's how's your coffee oh. intake? Did you try one of those iced coffees? Uh, no, we're going, we're uh, Joe Rockwell and I got to run some errands. We're going to run by today. But here's the thing I came in, I want you to know I manned up. I didn't put any creamer in my coffee, to eat coffee today. What do you think of that? How was I, it? Is life changing? Well, I'll tell you what. It brought a flavor that that the creamer kind of hides. It it sort of the co- hides the coffee. The true that's flavor. coffee. Yes. Yeah, that's coffee. There is a flavor to coffee. And it's been so long since I've done that. Guess what? I might, I might continue this little practice, that, you know, of of not putting any creamer in my coffee. I'm telling you right now, I had the taste of coffee that I haven't had in several years. What do you think of that? Here's one of those drinking black coffee is one of those things that you have to tell everybody that you do, right? Like it's like, it's like if you eat your steak rare or medium rare, you got to kind of talk about it and tell people about it. I, I, I like, you know, sometimes we, I'm like, why, why do marathon runners have to tell everybody that they're training for a marathon or running? Like why do runners need to tell everybody that they're running? And I sort of poke fun at that. But I'm the same way with black coffee. It's one of those things. Yeah, I, I I drink I drink black coffee. Well, you like, said I, I it like a coffee. man yesterday. You have to. You, like, have to t- yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, said you have it to. Like, look at me. I'm yeah, a man. Yeah, look at me. Huh? I drink black. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those things. It's like it's like eating a steak, rare to medium. I, I listen. I eat my I eat my steak rare. Like I come on now. Like I'm, don't don't. I'm gonna look down at you if you don't. Like it's one of those <laughs> weird things, right? Like that we do, and I I don't know why. Like it's this badge of honor, yeah. this this pride we take. Oh, I sensed uh, that. Okay. I sensed it yesterday. By the way, yeah. this is a dumb question. I know this is dumb, and I think you do. But uh, HTO, you have black coffee at HTO. I I, I'm Paul. This is not an endorsement. I mean, it, I guess it is, but it's the truth. I think that our House brew black coffee is some of the best I've ever had. Okay, it's so what I brew it. at okay. home. I All brew right. it at home every day. Okay, we sell it in the store. We yeah. brew it fresh in the store. You can get it in the store, or you can take a bag of it home. I think just the regular house brew is as good a black coffee as okay. I've ever had. Well, I'm, and I'm not saying that just because it's our business. I'm saying that because I love coffee, and and I'm not a coffee snob. By the way, I know I brag about black coffee. I'm not a coffee snob. I don't know a lot about sure. coffee. I don't know. Sure, you like, don't know. I don't know. I don't know all the intricacies of it. I just know it tastes good. Right. Right. Like that's all I know. Right. Um, but you know, we have all maybe this, you know, your creamer and the coffee guy, Paul, these iced coffees that we just rolled them out yesterday. And they they sound amazing. People are are loving them now about, you know, 24, 36 hours into it. Uh, so you know, it's okay. Not Paul, I'm not going to judge you if you want to put creamer in your coffee. I'm not going to sit here and think that I'm better than you because I drink black coffee and you put creamer in your coffee. I'm not going to do that, Paul. No, you think but, you're you more know, manly than me. That's Listen, I got yeah. that sense. You're more of a man than me. And Jad's over here ch- chuckling like crazy, like, yeah, right. I mean, come on now. I mean, let's face it. You think you're more of a man than me. Let's be honest with the listeners here. If you're a listener and you drink black coffee, how often do you tell people that you drink your coffee black? Well, that's a good question. Because it's probably pretty often. You think probably so? Probably pretty often. Really? Yeah. Do you, do you it's think one so? of those things that we, like oh, nobody cares. That. I don't know about nobody that. Nobody cares. It's one of those things. It's like, it's like, uh, it's like if you're training for a marathon or if you're, you know, doing whatever diet, like nobody actually cares, but we feel this inclination to tell them anyway. <laughs> I, I'm guilty of it with the coffee thing. Okay. Like, I, like nobody cares that I drink 
coffee black. I, but I do. And I, and I, for some reason, feel this urge to tell people about it. Well, congratulations. But Paul, no judgment here. Look, no, if you want, if you judge. want to put a bunch of creamer in your coffee, go. I mean, I, oh, listen, see, I'm not here to judge. I'm descending. Now I'm not here to judge. judge. No, no, if you, oh, oh, you're if not you judging. want to do that. No, you're not judging. If you want no. to do that, you go for it. No, you're not judging. 869-1240. No. We'll come back. We'll tell you what's on tap today. All right. Uh, black coffee for me. We'll be right back. <laughs> Spring is in the air, and that means one thing. Dandelions are coming. Don't let those annoying yellow weeds invade your lawn again. This year, trust your lawn to Ryan Lawn and Tree. This is Larry Ryan. No other lawn care company delivers the results that Ryan Lawn and Tree delivers. More than just providing a beautiful dandelion-free lawn. Your trusted pros in the clean red trucks make sure your entire landscape is healthy, strong, and ready to look great no matter what nature throws at it. And unlike the other guys, the pros at Ryan Lawn and Tree are employee owners, full-time professionals going above and beyond every day with five-star customer service. Call us or click ryanlawn.com today. And as a new customer, you'll save 50% on your first lawn application. Enjoy a worry-free, effort-free, dandelion-free lawn this year with Ryan Lawn and Tree. An anniversary is a very special occasion, something that you will remember and celebrate year after year. Mike Seltzer Jewelers has been celebrating anniversaries of all kinds since 1950. Once a year during Mike Seltzer's anniversary sale, he marks down almost everything in the store. Now through the end of June, you can save up to 50% off rings, earrings, necklaces, and bracelets. Save up to 50% off. Visit Mike Seltzer Jewelers at 2929 North Rock Road and view the best quality and largest selection of jewelry in Wichita. Now, if you need help with financing, Mike can help with that too. Don't wait and let another year go by. Take advantage of the huge 50% off savings now. For more information, visit MikeSeltzerJewelers.com or stop by the store. Mike Seltzer's Jewelers, 2929 North Rock Road in the Comatera Shopping Center. Remember, 50% off. Don't miss this sale. At Mike Seltzer Jewelers. Hurry, sale ends June 30th. Yingling Aviation is a leader in the aviation industry in Wichita and around the world. We're innovating, leading, and hiring AMP mechanics and more. Receive up to a $2,500 sign on bonus, competitive pay, health, dental, vision, and life insurance, 401k, paid vacation, and more. We offer a family atmosphere, creative culture, and the opportunity to advance in your career. Join the Yingling Aviation team and grow with us. All positions apply online today at yinglingaviation.com while openings are still available. Do you have three ex-wives and your current trophy wife wants a life insurance policy three times the size of the policies you had to purchase for your previous mistakes? If so, you need to call Big Lou at Term Provider, 800-700-6898. Big Lou is intimately familiar with your problems. And if you're 50 or 60 years old and in reasonably good health, a $1 million policy should only cost about $100 to $200 per month. Big Lou may have a solution for your previous policies as well. You may even save enough money to lighten the load on your new $1 million policy. Remember, call Big Lou. He's like you, except he's only on number two. Call Term Provider at 800-700-6898. That's 800-700-6898. For a million dollars in term life insurance that you can live with, call Big Lou at 800-700-6898. 800-700-6898. With summer savings at the Home Depot, we have laundry appliances that just fit. Fit your space, fit your needs, and fit your budget. Like a new LG laundry set with six motion technology using different wash motions to get clothes cleaner. And sensor dry to automatically adjust drying time, all making laundry quicker, cleaner, and easier on your clothes. Save up to 30% on select appliances, plus up to $100 off select laundry sets at the Home Depot. Pricing valid May 18th through June 7th, 2023. U.S. only see store online for details. It's time to turn up your summertime fun with Twisted Tea Hard Iced Tea. T-N-T. Twisted Tea is a smooth, refreshing, real brewed tea with 5% alcohol. So whether you're camping, fishing, or at the beach with friends, don't forget to fill your cooler with those bright yellow cans. 
Twisted Tea Hard Ice Tea. Keep it twisted. Twisted Tea the KFH Studios, powered by Devon James Injury Lawyers. Call 888-8888. That's 888-8888. I'ma give it to you when you want it. Do you have the Odyssey app yet? I'ma give it to you. Give it Listen to us plus other Odyssey radio stations when you want it and hundreds of your favorite podcasts. Get it in the App Store. A U D A C Y. Sports, entertainment, guy talk. That's who we are. 97.5 and 1240 KFH. Wichita's most listened to sports radio. 97.5 and 1240 KFH. All right, everybody, that'll do it for us. Glad to be here with you on this edition of Sports Day. By the way, we'll talk about this tomorrow. Naquan Tomlin, out of the draft and back to K-State basketball. Obviously a massive move for them. Uh, we'll uh, you know, we'll talk more about that again tomorrow. Jim Rome at 11, Bob and Jeff at 2, Maggie and Perloff at 4, Zach Gelb at 5. That's the lineup today here on KFH. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching on our video stream as well. For Paul Savage and Jad Chambers, I'm Jake Balbrock. We'll see you Thursday.